All right, so listen, if your legs work, I need you to stand on them. I just want you to honor the Word of God. We're about to jump straight in. No analogy, no super deep story, uh, just a very, very easy scripture that many of us have, have heard before. This is what it says. For my yoke, say yoke. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. For my yoke. Say yoke. Uh, now, before I give you the title, before you take your seat, I was in the office earlier this morning with one of my young adults, and I said, man, you know, you, you know what a yoke is, right? And, and he said, uh, yeah. He said, uh, the center of an egg. I said, man, you, you, you're, you're wrong. Because um, it's not spelled the same. And it's, it's cool. It's cool in the because there was at a point in time I, I thought the same thing. So before we, we get here, I need to explain what yoke means. Yoke, here's the verb, the verb, what yoke means. It means attach with. Say attach with. Say tied to. So scripture says, for my yoke, my connection, my attachment is easy. And my burden is light. Before you take your seat, look at your neighbor and say, my hands are tied. Yeah, my hands are tied. You may be seated. My, my hands are, my hands are tied. Have you ever, have you ever regretted being connected to someone or something? At least I know I have. There are many people that I found myself in different seasons connected to. And after I realized that I was connected to them, I realized that there were more things about them that I disliked than I liked when I first got connected. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever given your number out to someone, exchanged usernames or Instagram accounts with someone and they have become more of a pest than a partner. Yeah, uh, so like somebody like, you know that crazy girl too? No, I don't know her. Uh-uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> but, but have you ever regretted? Have you ever regretted the connection with someone because you realize that they put on a front when you started to talk to them, but then by the time you realize who they actually were, you felt like you were in too deep to leave the situation? It's, it's, it's a sticky place to be in. It's a place that many of us, we find ourselves in on a consistent basis. But now conversely, conversely, have you ever been so satisfied with the connection that you've had with someone or with something? There is this great satisfaction, this great level of gratification that I get when when I am connected to the Savior. I remember when I committed my life to Christ, and I remember when I told everyone around me that I was turning from anything that I did not believe was of Christ, and I started following God. I can tell you this, I have never in my life regretted my connection to the kingdom. I've never regretted my connection to the kingdom because pay attention. Here's my first couple of points, or I don't even know if they're points, they're almost questions that I would need you to, to, to think on, to ponder on whenever you leave here. Here's the first question. What are the consequences of connection? What, what are the consequences of connection? Every connection that you have in your life, there's a consequence. It's a consequence. Now, because we have been taught um, probably inappropriately, incompletely, when we hear the word consequence, we automatically think of something negative. When consequence is not, it's not a negative word, it, it is just to tell you that there is cause and effect in everything that we do. There can be a positive consequence and there can be a negative consequence, but I have to let you know that before you leave here today, any connection that you have in your life, you have to ask the question, what are the consequences of this connection? 
what am I going to get out of this connection? Because if the only thing that I'm going to get out of this connection is a whole bunch of depressed conversation, if the only thing that I'm going to get out of this connection is you calling me when you're in a bad place, but when I call you, it seems as if you don't have enough time. There are connections that we have in our life, and we haven't necessarily weighed the consequences of those connections. It's funny because people think that I'm Hollywood or people think that I'm bougie. People are getting the line. And we'll be praying and we'll be talking. And then after we get finished praying and we'll be talking, they'll say, hey, Pastor Live, shoot me your number. No. It's not happening. It's not not happening. It's it's not happening. I I can't give you my I can't give you my number because I don't know what the consequence is for this connection. See, I I don't know if you understand boundaries. I don't know if you understand the call that is on my life. I don't know if you understand that I can't pick up every time you call. And then the next thing you know, if I don't pick up because God is calling me to do something now, now you calling me out of my name. And then I got to call the troops to come get you because you called. No, I'll just play. (laughs) But that went real far. It's like, dang, he, yeah, it's okay. It's okay because I ought to preach the funeral. It's all good. Like, I'm a preacher. No, it's okay. What, What are the consequence of connection. But here's another question that you have to ask yourself. It's actually internal. It's actually internal. What are your contributions to the connection? See, a lot of times when we are connected to people, we are always trying to figure out what is it that they can do for me? What am I, what am I going to gain because they're in my life? My question is, with every connection that you have, how do you add to it? Yeah, you, you, you got with him because he's a great man of God. But my question is, are you going to be a benefit or a bill? Well, I'm, I'm going to do, well, no, no. Well, you didn't tell him that you had $170,000 in student loans. You should be a doctor by now. What, what do you actually contribute to the connection because every person that you are connected to, let's be very clear, You want to get something out of it, and they want to get something out of it. When I got connected to my wife, I wanted to get something out of it, and she wanted to get something out of it. It is a very, very important thing that you weigh your contribution to every single connection, and then you also weigh what the consequence is to the connection that you are going into. So now when you leave here, you're going to be looking at your phone like, "Mm mm-mm, consequence, negative, consequence, negative, consequence. Oh, you a good one, Keith. You're going to start deleting numbers, people are going to be reaching out to you, you ain't going to answer, and you're going to respond back. Just send them the link to this message and they'll get it. (laughs) Say connections. In the text that we're going to talk about today, Jesus is describing the consequence of being connected to him. He is describing the contribution that he will make in your life if you stay connected to him. These are scriptures that we've heard time and time again, that we've almost made memory verses, but not understood the criticality of the words that Christ is speaking in this moment, because if we did, We'll hold on to it in a different way. So my goal, my goal today is to simply give you a fresh revelation or illuminate something that you've never seen before in this particular text. And if you've seen it before, don't tell anybody because then you'll blow my, my sermon. This is what scripture says, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you what? Rest. We've now, now let's be very clear, as a pastor, I don't know how many times I've repeated this in prayers. Come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden or heavy burdened. And in this scripture, I love it because this scripture is a great depiction of God's grace. This scripture is a great depiction of what God wants to do for you. He is saying that everything that you are wrestling with, anything that's making you weary, anything that got you stressed out, hair falling out, all 
ulcers. And then all of this stuff that's happening, everything that's happening in your life, what I want you to do is I want you to bring it to me and I will give you what? Rest. Rest, rest, rest. Rest is a word that many of us really don't understand. Many of us don't really digest the thought process of what a good rest day would do for you. See, I'm 30, I'm 35 now, and now I understand how important rest is. And my body don't function the way that it used to function anymore. I take naps. Yeah, naps. They're holy. Yeah, you know how many times y'all saw Jesus in the Bible taking naps? He was on a boat with the disciples. He was at the bottom of the boat doing what? Taking a nap. Went up and prayed. What happened? Took a nap. But then there are times where you don't nap. He came down and got mad at everybody else for napping. Oh, that's a tricky God you got there. <laughs> but rest. I remember when I first started pastoring, I was convinced that rest meant that you were supposed to go out of town. I thought that was rest. So every time I got tired, I would look at my wife. I'd say, I got to go for a week. I got I to gotta go. I got to go. And, and, and then I realized that when you really don't know what rest is, you will go out of town tired and come back. Can I get a witness? Right? It's like, it's like when you go, you will go for a week. The first five days, you balling on the budget because we ain't got it like that. But you ball on the budget for five days. The last two days... The last two days, you're stressed about coming back home because you know that what you really wanted to get rest from is going to be waiting for you when you get back. Rest. But now, contrarily, contrarily on the other side, right, to, to compare and to contrast, you can come to church on a Sunday morning. You can be stressed Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. and you go home, you feel better than you did when you went on vacation. That's why you guys come here. You don't come here just to hear me speak or because I sound cool. No, you come here because you understand that what you are going to get here is actually going to help you out there. This is what this means in the text. It says that all of those who are weary and heavy burdened, all of those who are going through some things, all of those who are too stressed to feel blessed, all of those who feel like you are carrying the weight of the world, he is saying, come to me and and I will give you what real rest is. Now, this is what's important because when we go on vacation, we escape. And we've always thought that rest was when we escaped. So we'll escape and we'll think we're getting rest until we come back and realize that we are not rested. But what God says is the rest that I'll give you. It's not just an escape. It's an exchange. This is what scripture is saying. Scripture says, all ye who weary and heavy burden, bring your weariness and bring your heavy weights to me. And when you come to me, I won't just let you escape. I'll let you exchange. This is why it's very important that you find a good church to go to. This is why it's very important that you get the word of God. This is why it's very important that you know what the scripture says. Because if you don't know what the scripture says and you came in here thinking that you were just escaping and not exchanging, you have misunderstood the assignment. So let me stop this right now. For those who are watching online, depending on where you're watching from, for those who are in the room, if you left all of your cares and your worries in the car, go get them. Yeah, if you left them at the house, no worries. I'll stay here until you circle back. Because there is no sense of you coming into the house of God one way and then leaving the same way. No, the God that I serve said, bring me your, jo bring me your sorrow and I'll give you joy. Give me your ashes and I'll give you beauty. Give me your mess and I'll give you a miracle. Because the house of God is a place where you are not only here to escape, but you are here to make sure that you exchange because godly rest is an escape and an exchange. Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy burdened, I will give you. Then it goes on to say in verse 29, and we're probably going to stay in verse 29 for the, rest of the, for the rest of the sermon. 
And the rest of the time that we have together will probably be in verse 29. It says, take my yoke, say yoke, upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Good God. Doesn't that feel good? It says, it says, take my what? Yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am what? Gentle and what else? Humble. Humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Let's go, let's start, let's start at the A clause. A clause, the first word in this scripture is beautiful. It says, take. Say take. Now, if you read this scripture incorrectly, you would almost think that Jesus is forcing you to take something. Take my yoke. No, 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 no. Jesus is not going to force you to take anything that you won't receive. And then on the other hand, Jesus is not, uh, what's a good word, good theological word, uh, a punk. Right, he's not that. So he's not saying that I have something and you can just take it from him. He won't force you to take anything you won't receive and then he won't allow you to take anything that he hasn't made for you. So now what I need you to imagine is when the scripture says, take my yoke, it is not him forcing, and it is not you forcing yourself on him, it is an offer. I want you to imagine him with something in his hand, and he's saying, take my yoke. T take it, take it. Listen, I I I've extended this opportunity. Take this gift. Take, take this yoke. What did I tell you what a yoke was? Tied to. Take this connection. Take, take this connection, and it is our job as the saints, it is our job as the Christian community for him to now reach out his arm and for me to grab on to what he's trying to give me. Take. See, because what God is trying to do in your life, he's trying to add favor to your life. He's trying to add opportunity to your life. Well, pay attention. Yoke connection, right? He is trying to connect with you with no contingencies. Oh, my goodness. See, the reason why this doesn't hit well with some is because every connection that you have comes with contingencies. So it's like, I'll do this if you do this. I'll be there for you here if you're here for me. And so now you get tired of realizing that every connection is conditional. And now you've come in here because you've realized that after all of the conditional connection has now left your life, you realize that there were one that you have never seen with your eyes, but he's always been in you. This is what I've been trying to help people understand, that God loves you without contingencies, nor does he love you because of a certain condition. God says that for God so loved the world that he gave. He didn't say the good world, the bad world, the those. No, he said the whole world. I looked at them and said I created them from dust, breathed my breath inside of them. Now they are moving. Now they are alive. I love them before they ever loved me. Can I get 50 people in the room today that can know and testify that he loved you way before you loved him? How many things have you ever been able to survive? How many places did he come and get you out of before you walked your nice looking self in here today? You look cute today, but years ago, you know that you were down. You know that you were not in a good situation. It is because he loved you without conditions. Before you got in the parking lot, he loved you. Before you start reading your word, he loved you. Before you start praying, he loved you. Before you became a wife, he loved you. Before you became a father, he loved you. Before you had money, he loved you. When you were down and out, he loved you. When you started getting big, he loved you. Once you start gaining influence, he loved you. The love of God is not that which can be broken just by a matter or a moment, God will continue to love you without contingencies. Take it. Now, pay attention because the scripture now gets a, little, gets a little interesting because it says, take what? Take my what? 
yoke. For those who are online, type yoke, 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 not Y-O-L-K-Y-O-K-E, yoke. Take my yoke. It says take my, my yoke. I told you earlier, today is going to be a little different. We're going to clap. We're going to shout. We're going to learn. So if you got your notebook, get your notebooks ready because we've already hit a few scriptures. I gave you a couple questions, but now I want to break down what yoke means. I told you this earlier. It's on the screen. Yoke from a verb perspective is this. It means attached with or tied to. It's a connection. That's what a yoke is. Right? But now I have to teach you. Agriculturally, I always teach my guys who are under me just studying, learning how to preach, learning how to teach. I say there are kind of three steps, three steps, three steps. What you want to do is you want to know um, the culture, right? You want to know the culture. You want to know, you want to know who God is talking to. You want to know, you want to know, then you want to know the context. You want to know what's going on in that time. Why is God actually saying this? And then we'll build the bridge of contemporization, right? Then we'll make it make sense to the people who are in the room. Yoke is not a word that we typically use in this day and age because in this day and age, we are not farmers. This is an agricultural word. It's very important that you know this. See, when Jesus is talking to the people, the culture, the context in which he's speaking to, you have to remember that the main medium and mode of exchange is based off of what you produce on your farm. So this is, remember, when we always hear the Jabez prayer, when Jabez says, why don't you increase my territory? Jabez is talking about land, but he understands that he's really asking God to increase his influence. Because the more land you own, the more influence you had. So he didn't just want to grow more apples or grow more corn. He wasn't asking God to just increase it so I can open up a grocery store. No, he is saying, God, increase my territory so that I can increase my influence because those who follow God should have more influence. This is why we are messed up in the culture that we're in now because I see people who love God but no influence. So now I need people who love God who can hold their integrity and character with influence so that now we can walk in boardrooms and people still respect us the same way that they respect others. Agricultural term. Yoke. So what is a yoke? A yoke is this, this apparatus that you put on, on the neck of a, of, a, of a cow, an ox, right? Here's the, the, the legit definition. A wooden beam sometimes used between a pair of animals. It, it's, it's a pair of animals. And I know it's kind of hard to really understand that. So what we did was we, we, we put it on the screen. I'm going to show you what it is. I'm going to show you what it is. This is, this, is what, this is what a yoke looks like. Y'all see the, the two oxen, you got this, this thing around their neck. And, and the idea of this, just to give you context, you need context, you need context. Um, this right here is in play because there are no tractors, right? There, there aren't any plows. So what happens is in order for you to till or plow a field, you would have to put this around their necks because those are the things that are going to pull so that we could plow the field. Does that make sense? So now, there are some rules, there are rules when it comes to yoking animals together. There's rules to the game. You just can't yoke any animal together, right? There are rules to this thing because you not only want to yoke them together because they're animals, you want to yoke them together because they are going to be able to carry out a specific task. Here are the rules. You put a strong ox with a strong ox because you can get the maximum capacity out of two strong things. This is why scripture tells us not to be yoked with unbelievers. This is why scripture says that when you're out there looking for a mate, don't be yoked with somebody who's unevenly yoked, right? Because what it's saying is that you got so much purpose in you. You got so many dreams in you. There's so much vision before you that if you find yourself yoked with somebody who is not strong, you're going to find yourself not accomplishing anything that God has called you to do. Let me tell you what happens when you yoke something strong with something weak. The strong one is always going to pull the weak one. Two strong oxes will go straight. But 
one weak ox and one strong ox will start going in circles. And many of you are in here today because it feels like you're going in circles. And you think it's you, but it's not you. It's the one that you're yoked to. It's the one that you're connected with. So every time you turn around, it's like, I, I saw this before. I've been through the same things. And you're revisiting the same traumas that you did your best to get out of. But the only reason you can't get out of that circle is because of your circle. What are the consequences of the connections that you have? Yoked to people who refuse to get stronger. Why, why are you still in the projects? You know, I mean, everybody, all, all, my, all my folks in the project, yoked with people who don't want to get stronger. Let, let's, let, let's go out and do this. Well, ain't nobody got no money. No, 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 your circle ain't, ain't got no money. No, we... There is some money out here. It's just that in, in your circle, they ain't got none. And because you refuse to leave that circle, ain't nobody, I was just, no, ain't nobody in your circle ain't got none. No, people in my circle got a little change. People in my circle want to go on vacation. People in my circle want to send our babies to school. People in my circle want to drive better. People in my circle want to bless people. People in my circle. Yeah, don't, don't put your circle mentality on my circle. No, baby, I'm yoked with some great people. It's, it, it's, 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 it's being yoked. And now, here's an exception to the rule. Here, here's the exception to the rule. What's the exception to the rule, Pastor Lad? The exception to the rule is when it is time to learn. So. Scripture says this in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. I told y'all, we're going to stay in 29 for a little while. Y'all better be prepared. Do not flick your page. If I hear one page flick, <laughs> you are being disobedient. Because <laughs> we in verse 29. Verse 29 says, again, take my yoke upon you. And then it says what? And learn from me. And learn from me. Here's the exception to the rule, sweetheart. You can put a weak animal with a strong animal when it's time to train. Yeah. Yeah, see, see, because, help you understand, you can't put two weak animals together because they won't push each other to grow. Yeah. Yet yeah, many of us aren't growing, not because we don't desire it, just because we're coupled with somebody who's always on the same level as us. And because they're always on the same level as us, they don't see past that level. My pastor used to tell me, if you're the richest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Because that room will never push you to another level of greatness. But God, I speak greatness over the people of the Remedy Church. I speak greatness of those who are watching online from wherever you are. I speak I speak greatness over your situation. I, I speak expansion of rooms. I speak expansion of territory. I speak expansion of increase. Why? Because you are finding yourself in rooms with people who will not allow you to meddle in mediocrity. You are better than average. You are not like your mama in them. You are better than the people who created the spaces for you. No, I'm trying to push you to understand that there is greater inside of you. And now, the only way that you grow to that level of greatness is if you take your weak self and match yourself up with somebody who's stronger. Stop all that insecure talk. I feel like they look down on me. Well, they live in a penthouse. What do you want them to do? I feel like they think they better than me because they got more money. No, they don't think they better than you, but the experience that they have in life may be just a step above yours, except that that insecure stuff got to leave. You can't grow when you're insecure. You can't be challenged when you're insecure. You can't go to another level when you're insecure. And so now, Scripture shows us that when you are training something weak, you can match it with something strong. Oh, let's get back to the Scripture. You'll understand it now better. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Here it is. Here, here's my big point. Don't link with somebody that you can't learn from. Ooh, we. Oh, oh, we. Um, 17 years in the game, been with my baby mama. 
11 years married this week. Oh, we 11. Hey, 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 Phil. 11 years in that thing. Oh, we. Well, I tell you, I got so many bad jokes in my head. Let me just keep it moving. Y'all going to leave my church. But let me tell you, you're going to hate being married to somebody for 11 years and one day be laying in the bed looking at them sleep, thinking to yourself, I done married a dummy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You're going to hate it. Look over like, I, I, can't, I can't learn nothing from you. So I'm tied to you, but you can't teach me nothing? Like, yeah, I, I'm tied to you. You ain't helped my prayer life, my business life, my family life, my parental life. Like, like what, are, what are you there for? Now, if it's just to make my body feel good, shame on me. But I could have done that in the streets. Like, when I got with you, I expected for our life to go to another level. And now I'm not yielding from this yoke. I'm not getting anything out of this. And the worst thing that can happen is that you yoke yourself up to somebody that you can't learn from. I just want me a cute one. If they are cute but they don't know how to pray, cute going to fade. I want somebody with some money. Well, if they have money but they have no integrity, trust and believe that you're going to feel it in the next 10 years. And we find ourselves with these cute yokes around our necks going around in circles. Going around in circles. Because we didn't realize that they were cute vessels, but no substance inside. The scripture says, y'all get me all excited. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. It, it's very interesting because what Jesus is saying here, he's saying, and learn from me. So what he's saying is this, you being yoked to me doesn't make you equal. This ain't example one where I got too strong. No, no, this is example two. You're yoked to me because you need to learn. Yeah, you need to learn. Yeah, I I'm trying to train something up in you. And the issue is, is that we have followed leaders who felt like they were at the end of their learning. And once your leader stops learning, they become a lid. And it stops your growth. Every time you smack up to the lid and you wondering why you always in the same situation. I've been in this church for 22 years and you still act like you 22. It's partly your fault because you can go out and get instruction on your own, but it's partly your leader because they stop learning. Households stop learning. And so now God is saying that you are connected to me because you got some learning to do. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. We still in verse 29. Hold your horses. And then it goes on to say, for I am gentle and humble. Catch, catch the word. In heart. <laughs> in heart. I laugh because I know what I'm about to say. It's really good. And so, like, seriously, I was like, dang, like, I know where you're going with this one. It says, because I am gentle and humble in heart. So I don't know if 696 kids is a real thing still. I'm not 100% sure. If it is, I tried to call, I tried to call 696 kids on my mom one day, and I got a whooping for that. <laughs> like, I know that. I'm like, I don't think this is how that's supposed to work. Uh, but what happens, what happens, um, I remember one time, maybe, this, maybe your parents didn't do this. My mother, and, and I'm saying I'm not pressing charges, so for those who are here, it's like you can steal the statute of limitations. Still, no, no, I'm going to let her be free. What happened, what happened was I did something, and she whooped me good. Whooped me good. Whooped me good. And after she whooped me, Bishop, she said, I did this because I love you. 
That happened to y'all? Don't raise your hand because you're going to incriminate your parents too. But listen, if it happens to you, just wink your eye. When, if you sit next to your mama, wink your eye because she's going to hit you right now. Your mama going to hit you right now. You 37 years old. She'll smack you right now if you say, don't tell that man I've been hitting on you. <laughs> she said it's because I love you. Now what was weird was that her actions, in my opinion, didn't depict her heart. But for her, her actions not only depicted her heart, but it was to help make my heart like her heart. So I'm tripping because the text says that I am gentle and I am humble in heart. It's like Jesus has given himself a way out for the times when we feel like he is not gentle. It's like we had to come to a realization that, yeah, my, my, my mother's whooping me because she loves me. She had to keep telling me this so that I knew that the consequences was not because she didn't have hope in me. The consequences were there because she did. And I'm speaking to somebody today who you feel like you're going through hell and high water. You feel like everything in your life is a big ball of consequences, negative consequences. But God is here telling you, I'm whooping you not because I don't love you. I'm whooping you because I love you. And what you need to be more fearful of is if I didn't have my hand on you. See, when I whoop you, my hand is still on you. So be fearful when I take my hand off of you. Because that's when the vultures come. That's when the enemy comes to seek. To seek those in whom he may de devour. It's, 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 I'm, I'm gentle and I'm humble in the heart. Because he had to put that in there. Because if he didn't, I'd be like, now Jesus... I didn't see you do some aggressive things. Peter, Peter, man, Jesus, you ain't got to do that. He said, Satan, get behind me. Gentle? You called your best, you called one of your best friends. The devil. He said, Satan, get behind me. I'm like, woof. Jesus goes in the temple, start flipping over tables. Oof. Gentle? Oh, my Lord. Okay, well, okay. Okay, well, let's be clear, Pastor. I mean, okay, he was a little aggressive in those moments, but we can't talk about humility. Jesus is the most humble person. I agree, I agree. But it was like this one time, his friend was like, how do we get to Jesus? I mean, how do we get to heaven? He was like, I am the way. Like, whoa, why are you saying like that? I am the way, I am the truth, and I, the only way you get to the Father is by way. I was like, whoa. It's like, bro, like, calm down. So there are things that we can take out of context and believe that he is not gentle or not humble, but we have to examine the heart. Because he tells Peter, he calls Peter Satan when Peter is trying to derail him from his destiny. He flips over tables when they're prostituting the temple. He says, I am the way because he needs them to understand that in due season, there are going to be many gods resurrected before you. But there is no God like the God that you are with today. There is no God that will be able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can hope, ask, or think. There is no God that will be able to pull you out of the valley of despair and put you on a mountaintop of prosperity. There is no God like me. And it is very important for him to let you understand who you are yoking yourself up to and that he is humble and he is gentle. But some of you guys are yoked to him and you feel like it's, it's not that gentle. So, crazy prayers. We're going to make a crazy prayer, a, a pastor laugh crazy prayer list. This was one of my crazy prayers. Prayed this last night. It's embarrassing. I said, Jesus, can you come back for 11 o'clock service so that I can show the people what it means to be yoked by you? He answered me. He said, no. Yeah, that's it. That's it. 
if he comes back, we in some trouble. Okay, so he's like, no, I, I can't come to your 11 o'clock service. I said, okay, cool. I said, well, I got to go with my second best option. So last night, um, Keyshawn, come up here. I needed somebody um, who, who looked stronger than me. Let's be very clear. <laughs> it's like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm very clear. Ain't no sucker. All right, so here it is. So, so this, is, this is Keyshawn. All right. Now, ladies, he's taken. Let's be very clear. He is on the safety team. He's strong. All that good stuff, he is taken. Beautiful, bright little baby. He got that. All right, so I just want to – see, I told you I got you, big dog. I got you. Um, so now, here it is. So I called Keyshawn, and I said, I need you to be God. He was like, sure. <laughs> he answered me in his best God voice. So now, because I didn't feel like going to grab a yoke, uh, plus, I'm skinny. The yoke would have came off my neck. It would have been embarrassing. Y'all have put me on Instagram. I'd have been, I'd have been mad. I'd have been mad at you, put you out. It's been a whole bunch of stuff. So my thing is I want to save you embarrassment and me embarrassment. So I said, what is the greatest thing that I can do to show and be an example of being yoked or tied to someone? So I do things that I know I'm not supposed to do. Like I called one of our police officers and I said, hey, I need to borrow your cuffs. It sounds normal to me, okay? Like, I, I, like I'm, I'm going to ask for a police horse next, but we'll see what happens. So h- here it is. You got me? Not too, not too tight. I ain't been in cuffs in a long time. It's, <laughs> y'all don't judge me. Yeah, God changed my life. Y'all, yeah. I ain't even like, I ain't even like that. I ain't even like that, ain't even like that laugh. <laughs> he been in cuffs before. You been in cuffs before too. Don't try to play me. So now... Now, when he says that I'm gentle and humble, what's conflicting in your mind is that you know you're connected to him, but it doesn't feel gentle at all. So the reason why you came in here today is because you feel like you are struggling with him, and you're trying to figure out why. Here's what it is. Um, Gentle. Uh, When God goes right and I go right, it's gentle. When God goes left and I go left, it's gentle. Why? It is because I am following his lead. So, so this is where we're trying to get people to live in. I- I'm trying to get you to live in your most prosperous space in life. But the only way that you get the chance to live that life is if you follow him step by step. So if he walks around and you're following him, there is no stress on your life. This is when your marriage is good. This is when your children are listening. This is when the business is going up. Hey, this is when you honestly may go through some stuff, but if you're with him, he's going to make sure he takes you through it. This is the type of situation. But then on the other hand, for some of us, we're yoked. We're connected. But he goes right. And we go left. Now, now pay attention. For those who are watching, the reason why you think there's no tension right here, preach, is because this represents grace. So he's going right, and you're going left, and you think that, oh, I'm in a good situation because ain't nothing happening to me. I don't feel swayed. I don't feel. But at some point in time, when you really operate by his word, there will come a time where the grace of God will run short. Then God will go right. And then you'll be trying to go left. And then you'll keep on trying to go left. But because he's stronger, you can't pull him. So many people come in the church feeling like they kicking and screaming, dragging. I can't believe I'm going through all this stuff. I gave my life to Christ 10 years ago. I've been praying. I've been reading. I've been fasting. But you still didn't start going right. And so now you think all the hell that's happening in your life is because he's not connected. But the reason why you're going through all the stuff in your life is because you are connected. 
And it's only but so far that he'll let you go. It's only but so far that you'll be able to wander. It's only but so far that you'll be able to go. Because the reality is, is that I'm joined to him. You may make me mad. I may feel like I'm about to cuss, but I ain't going to cuss because I'm connected to him. I may feel like I'm about to go off on you, but I can't because I'm connected to him. I may feel like letting my marriage go, but I can't because I'm connected to him. This is what a yoke looks like. And because God is so gracious, when you yoke to him, even when you in your mess, he's still with you. So you in there, he's still with you. You laying down, he's still with you. You losing your mind, he's still with you. And the crazy thing about it is that we've been praying to God that why are you, no, no, be happy that he's in it with you. Because if he had not been there, boy, you would have been taken out a long, long, long time ago. But praise be to God, the one that I'm connected to. There is, there is this yoke that we have with him. And the reality is that God is saying, I'm never going to take that yoke off. It says, what can separate me from his love? It says, not angels, not demons, not principalities, not height, nor depth. It says that there is literally nothing that will be able to dismantle the yoke that God has on your life. He said there's nothing that when I gave my blood, it don't fade like Kool-Aid. That it continues to stick on your life. It continues to stay on your life so that when the enemy comes to try to steal, kill, and destroy, he knows who you're with. It, it's, a, it's a yoke thing. And many of us, many of us, we don't understand what God is doing in our lives because we don't understand the criticality of the yoke. I'm yoked to him. I'm yoked to him. And so me being yoked to him is the reason why I don't do the things I used to do. See, a lot of people, a lot of people don't get this church enough credit. Uh -huh. We done saved a whole bunch of people from getting cussed out. Well, yeah, yeah, because some of y'all that came in here and you were on your last nerve. But then when you left, you left with five more nerves. And that left you good for a good week. So you keep on coming back because you realize that without him and being connected to him, that I would have ran short a long time ago. I'm yoked to him. My... My, my, my hands, my hands are tied. My, my hands are tied. Um, so, th th this is why. Um, th this is why, you deal with some of the things you deal with, in, in your mind. Even though sometimes you could be in certain situations that feel good, there's certain convictions that that pop into you. Why? Because with him, his connection comes with conviction. That's a key ingredient of Christ. A key ingredient to Christ, which I told y'all this past Easter, that if your Christ doesn't convict you, you're worshiping the wrong Jesus. Yeah. Remember when they chose Jesus Barabbas over Jesus the Christ, right? They picked the wrong Jesus because their Jesus came with no conviction. But if you pick Jesus the Christ, then you understand that because you're tied to him, when you're in those crazy situations and you feel like you need to get out of it, it is because you're tied to him. You don't feel that bad because you're bad. You feel that bad because he's good. Yeah. You don't feel that bad because you feel like there is no other possibility. No, you feel that bad because he's saying, do you know what I've created for you? I've created a clean heart for you if you wanted it. I've created ways for you to come out of this if you want it. There is always a way of escape because, 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 because our, because our, because our hands, our, our, our hands are, are tied and I, I was... I was preparing the, the conclusion of this message, and I felt like God spoke to me. I felt like he spoke to me because I was in a situation where he said, why do you make it sound as if 
being tied to me will only prevent you from doing bad things. Yeah, this is, that's, that's that uh, hellfire teaching. That's that, uh, get your life right or it's going to go wrong. Yeah, that's, 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 that, that's that teaching. That's, that, that's the teaching that, that tells So he says, why does it, so why all your examples got to be, when you tripping out, uh, he going to keep you because you're tied to him. And, and when you don't feel like being married no more, he gonna, he, when your mind is going crazy, you're, he says, they, need, they also need to know that when they walk into overflow, it's because they're tied to me. That when their marriage is doing well, it's because they're tied to me. That when their finances are going well, it's because they're tied to me. When their mind is actually clearer than it's ever been, it's because it's tied to me. Now I'm mature enough to know that God is not just preventing me from the bad, but he's also walking me into the good. That he says in his scripture that I'm blessed in the city and I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed going in and I'm blessed coming out. He calls me the righteousness of God. He calls me joint heir to the throne. He calls me a priest, a prophet, and a pastor. He calls me this stuff. And the reason why he calls me all of this stuff is because my hands are tied. This is why the scripture says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke, I'm only going to give you enough to build you, not kill you. My yoke is easy. You are attached to one that will be able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can hope, ask, or think. You're attached to me. You're attached to the one that in six days I spoke everything that you see. You're attached to me. You're attached to the one where ten lepers came with leprosy and they left all healed. You're attached to me where a man was down for 38 years and he called my name and I touched him and now... You're attached to me. The test is for your testimony, not for you to pass out. The yoke is easy and the burden is light. For those who are watching online, for those who are in this room, I would have taught you incorrectly if I did not start by telling you that the yoke is a choice. Take my yoke. There's an offer extended to you. And the offer is, can I have your life? The, the offer is, can you give me your soul? Now pay attention. I'm not saying that you're not going to make any more mistakes. I'm not saying that you're not going to fall to temptation. I'm not saying that you're going to be perfect. But listen. Can I at least walk with you? Because you've yoked yourself up to things that haven't been beneficial to you. And how many times are you going to keep, re keep re-yoking yourself to people who are not proving to you that they're worth your time, your effort, or your resources? Yoke yourself up to me. But it comes by way of, of accepting him. Prayer. It's thing that we call the salvation prayer. It's funny because you don't see this in Scripture. Um, yeah, you see, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, right? And, and it's to say that I'm, I'm making myself vulnerable. You don't necessarily see these words, right? These words because what we've done now is we've understood kind of like this, this method, this strategy in saying, okay, well, let me confess my sins. Let me ask them to come. And so this is where you get the salvation prayer. This is just me teaching you guys. Um, and then, you know, even things about prayer, people, we call it the Lord's prayer. Uh, what would the Lord have to pray for? The, Lord, the Lord's prayer. No, it's the model prayer. His, his disciples are with him and they're saying, can you teach me how to pray? He said, pray like this. If the Lord had to pray, he's going to pray to him. Hey, hey, me, hey, hey, me. Hey, me, uh, I, need, I need me to bless me because me is going through some stuff. No, it, it's the model prayer. Here it is. This is salvation prayer. What is the salvation prayer? This salvation prayer is an opportunity for you to confess with your mouth. But I tell people, many have confessed, but so little have believed. That's the issue. Many have confessed. So little have, have actually believed. 
So the goal is not just to simply confess, it is to believe. So for those who are in the room, if you could just do me a favor, if everybody can just stand up on your feet, you'll sit down in two seconds. But when people are standing on their feet, it says that you have their attention just a little bit more. And I need this to be the greatest attention catcher throughout this entire sermon. When you say this prayer, and if you're saying this prayer for the first time, one, let us know, and we'll tell you a way that you'll do that. But I really want you to believe this to your core, because your life will be forever changed. Repeat after me. Say, I see my need for Jesus. I confess I have sinned. I believe in his birth and his death and his resurrection from the grave. I ask your forgiveness. I ask that you save me. Come into my life. Make me new. I receive your grace, your favor, and your love in Jesus' name. Say it like you mean it, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's clap our hands for the person who may, I say, let's, let's give God glory. It says that heaven rejoices over one soul. Imagine hundreds right now giving their lives to Christ.